<laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning into my Chilean wine seminar, Zoom seminar here. This is going to be a good one because I've got so many pictures um, because I went to Chile in March of 2020. And I, I can't believe that it's been two years now, basically, since I went to Chile. I can't believe that it's been that long. Um, and at the same time, I can because the very beginning of the pandemic feels like it was a super, super long time ago now. Um, so uh, anyway, this will be good because I've got tons and tons of pictures. And that's what makes a good wine seminar, right? Is lots and lots of pictures and maps. Um, you should all have an email from me with a list of the wines uh, with prices and stuff. Um, if you're somebody who RSVP'd and got a sample kit. Uh, if you don't have a list of wines, let me know. I can email one to you. Also, I'll just tell you what they are all are in order right now. So there's numbers written on the little bottles. Uh, number one is Roberto Enriquez Notro Blanco. Number two is the Estacion Yumbel. Uh, I'll hold them up while I do this. So here's number one, Notro Blanco from Roberto Enriquez, uh, which was just in the New York Times in Eric Asimov's uh, whatever it was like 10 natural wines to pay attention to or to drink right now or whatever something like that uh oops whoops wrong one uh number two um estacion yumbel tinaja um estacion yumbel i will also refer to this as um mauricio gonzalez carreño because that's the winemaker and that's usually how i think of it uh number three is also mauricio uh, this is the Estacio Numbel Pipeño. Number four, back to Roberto Enriquez. This is Tierra de Pumas um, from uh, Guaraliwe, I believe, is the little town that's that vineyard is, is in. And then number five, Gonzalez Bastias Matoral Pais. So that's what the wines are in order. So uh, yeah, so this is Bio Bio Chile plus um, Itata. So yeah, all right. There's actually a one. There's a wine from Itata, and there's a wine from Maule. Uh, that's the Gonzalez Bastias, but um, it's. I'm just. I'm gonna call it Bio Bio. Uh, let me go to screen share. Bam. And then, uh, here we go. So here's a map. Um, this is Chile is a, you know, super, super long country. I don't think there's a, yeah, you don't see an actual picture of South America here, but you know, it's this, Chile is this strip of land running down the Pacific coast with the Andes mountains on one side and then the coastal range right on the Pacific here. And let's see, so here's Santiago, the capital, right up there. Um, when I move my cursor around, do you actually see the cursor moving on the screen? Cool, so yeah. I can actually like point to things. Okay, yeah, so Santiago, capital up here, and there's then you see all these wine regions around it, Maipo, uh, Colchagua, Cachapol, Curico down here. So there's this long central valley in between the two mountain ranges and you have a ton of you know you have snow up in the andes that melts and then runs down towards the pacific so there's all these rivers that run across the country going east to west um providing water to irrigate with or whatever for for farming so there's a ton of farming chile chile produces a lot of food it's a it's a very great easy place to grow food um because the coastal range over here blocks weather from the pacific um the pacific is relatively cold here because you have i think it's the humboldt current still i think it's the humboldt current that it runs all the way up the entire from south america up the coast of north america but anyway there's a current here bringing water up from uh the 
the Arctic and also the Antarctic, and also there's an upwelling of water by the coast here of colder, deeper water. So the, the Pacific is cold. So on the coast, it's relatively chilly. Um, but because of the coastal range blocking influence from the Pacific, it's pretty warm uh, all through here. Uh, particularly so up in here, and as you go you know, further north, you're closer towards the equator and it gets warmer. Um, all of this here, all, so yellow, that's Maule, then down here, the green, that's Itata, um, and then down here, the purple, that's Bio Bio. Zoom in a little bit more here. Yeah. Um, and the, what's sort of interesting about this is that right here, as you can sort of see, there's a gap where there, you don't see any mountains. The coastal range, there's a gap in the mountains here. And so um, cold air and weather and stuff from the Pacific can sort of make its way into this part of the Central Valley in here changes the, the environment. Um, and you have the city here, Concepcion. Concepcion is a pretty big city. I want to say Roberto, Roberto said it's like, I think he said it's like a million people. I want to say it's a big city. Um, and then you also have Talca up here in Maule. Talca is a more industrial city and you can see all these roads going to it. Like Talca is a, is a transportation hub. Um, and then down here, Concepcion is on the coast. Um, there's there's a, a large airport there and stuff like that. Um, Chile, I'll go into the history of it a little bit. So most of the population of Chile lives up here around Santiago. Uh, and up around Santiago, it's more sort of more European. It's more international. The people there look towards Europe, I feel like, more. They look towards Spain um, for, like, for culture and, and, and whatnot. Um, and just, and they, they identify with that. And a lot of the winemaking up there is, you know, Chile produces, I don't know how many times more wine than they consume, but Chile produces so much more wine than they consume. Many, many, many times they... You know, and they produce tons of fruit and vegetables for the rest of the world. And I'll get into this as we, I talk about it, but they're also, I think they're the second largest exporter of um, paper products of like a lot of raw or unfinished paper products in the world. Uh, so they're a, uh, like an agricultural um, production oriented uh, economy. Anyway, so so they they produce all this stuff for export and all the wine all the wine up here all of this up here in Maipo Casablanca Leda Maipo Colchagua Corico all the wine up there is made for export and it's a lot of um, you know winemakers from Europe consultant winemakers that were uh, are hired to come in and make wine uh, people from there going to Europe to study winemaking. They're very much, they're trying to make wine there that, you know, not exactly copies, but sort of mirrors like wines from Napa, wines from Bordeaux. Um, they're, they're making wines for Germany, for Great Britain, for America. They're making wines for like what they think the people there want to, uh, want to drink. Um, but as you go further south, it gets more and more rural and more and more, uh, I don't know, there's less and less infrastructure. Uh, and so the Spanish came into Chile in, uh, I want to say the like early, early 1600s and slowly worked their way from, came in from Peru, I believe, and then slowly worked their way down the country. Um, and they basically, they made it down here to the, where is it? the Bio Bio River, Rio Bio Bio right here. And they conquered this area and they, the Spanish sort of, they, so they ran into this indigenous culture called the Mapuche, um, 
the, the Mapuche weren't a single tribe, but it was, you know, like a constellation of native peoples that shared the same language and, you know, sort of culture and stuff like that. And the Mapuche uh, had already, they'd had some uh, interaction, I want to say with the, uh, the Inca empire. So they were sort of aware, the Mapuche were already aware that there were other cultures in the world that might be hostile to them. Um, so when the Spanish came down and ran into the, into the Mapuche, the Mapuche resisted them and they sort of coexisted for a while. Um, this was the like the front line, the border down here along Bio Bio. And so the, there were lots of Spanish troops, uh, colonists, and they brought vines and they were planting planting all these vines to produce wine for to drink for the ar army. It wasn't just producing wine for the church. They were producing large quantities of wine for, uh, for the army to, to drink. Um, but what's interesting, so then after, a, I want to say it was approximately 50 years, 40, 50 years, the Mapuche actually sort of or got organized, banded together, and they drove the Spanish out and reconquered I think pretty much all of, of this up through Itata. Um, so they drove the Spanish out. And I want to say, I think there was still, Concepcion was a little port, um, for, you know, fortress. Uh, and I think that was still Spanish, but, um, but anyway. So the Mapuche sort of like pushed the Spanish back and then, um, but they had already, you know, they'd already intermarried with the Spanish and so they sort of pushed out the Spanish government and soldiers, but they kept on making wine and there were vineyards there and stuff. So they just kept on making wine the way that these Spanish colonists had, had showed them and they never stopped. They just kept on making wine. Um, the people up in Santiago sort of looked down at southern chile and the people down there who more of them are of indigenous descent you know a lot of the people down there they they look different they look more native um and to an extent the people up north in santiago look at this part of chile as sort of being like rural backwoods um they 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 look down on them in in a way um and they just were never interested in the wines down here. They, they always viewed the wines down here. Pipeño was always viewed as like cheap rot gut, um, you know, bad, bad wine that, you know, poor people just drank to get drunk or just drank. It was just like a poor person's drink. Uh, so there was never any interest in it, which means that there was never any commercial pressure to produce more or change how it was produced or anything like that. So people just kept on making wine uh, really up until, geez, I forget. I don't know what exactly the year was, but there was a Frenchman, Louis Antoine Lut, who came over uh, for some reason and was blown away by these ancient vines and the winemaking. So Chile, I'll go back to screen share. Uh, Chile, because of the mountains on both sides, and then down south of here, you have Patagonia, and up north, you have the high, high desert of, um, of Peru. Um, there, there is no phylloxera in Chile. So vines that were, there are vines that are 200 years old. Uh, vines there's no phylloxera to kill them so there's all these ungrafted vines and the climate is fantastic it's it's sort of mediterranean um maybe even drier actually and maybe not quite as hot in the summer as as you know southern like provence places like that but it's but it's it's basically mediterranean um driving around down there you, I just, I saw vineyards everywhere and vines everywhere that had just gone wild that, you know, like when somebody stops taking care of a vineyard down here in Itata, Bio Bio, instead of the vines sort of just sitting there and 
you know, when you see abandoned vineyards in Europe, the, the vines usually sort of like slowly, slowly wither. They, 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 you know, they don't die immediately, but they, uh, they just sit there and they slowly, slowly die. Um, down there in Bio Bio Natata, when somebody stops taking care of a vineyard, the vine just explodes and starts growing up trees and stuff. And it's like the vineyards are, the vineyards are insane. Um, so Louis Antoine Lute came and was just blown away by these 200 year old vines and people still destemming the grapes by rubbing them on bamboo mats uh, or on ridge angled stones to crush the grapes. And then the juice, you know, runs down this inclined stone into a stone trough or a tank underneath it. Um, super, super primitive, just the same way that wine was being made in Spain 400 years ago. Um, and the wines were, were brilliant. So Louis Antoine Moot started uh, buying wine, bottling wine, you know, hired people to work for him to uh, bottle and make wine. And then he started exporting it to Europe and to America. And people paid attention because he was a, a French wine person. And, you know, so they were like, oh, well, if he's excited about these wines, they really, they must be pretty special. And people tried them and, and people were blown away. People, were, people lost their minds about these crazy wines from down here in rural Chile. Um, and, you know, and that like, that broke the barrier and got people to take these wines seriously and exposed people from here, from this area to the rest of the world, the rest of the wine world and stuff. And then other people here started really making wine and exporting, making wine for export because there, while there are a lot of vineyards here and a lot of wine made, a lot of it, um, why did I stop screen share? A lot of it is uh, made in a very small scale for local consumption. Um, let me find a, picture of, I'll go to Mauricio Gonzalez Carreño, because that's, a, I think, a good picture of like a, a typical sort of little winery. I'm actually not sure. I don't have a picture of like his entire winery, but here is, oh, that's a video. Never mind. Don't want to play that. Here's a picture of inside of his, that's basically, this is from the, the, the front door looking into his winery. So sand you know like dirt floor uh there's one light bulb and there's just there's you know the walls are branches next to each other with enough space to let light through so you can sort of see what you're doing inside the winery and this is you know he makes at this point he was making like 1700 um cases yeah 1700 cases of wine a year um but this is this is probably bigger than you know most people are just making wine in a shed or something like that um and using maybe some old chilean wooden vats uh probably a lot of um uh a lot of like people are probably making using a lot of like plastic tanks and just like whatever he's got actual barrels and you know different things anyway um so most winemaking here is just for, for local consumption or for their own consumption. Uh, the, oh boy, I forget the name of the producer now. The Lomas de La Juen that we have, uh, that's a Pipeño in a liter bottle. You know, we have glass one liter bottles of it, but locally they sell it in five liter plastic jugs that are there in Chile that are literally the, like, what a jug like you would go and get fruit juice at the grocery store. It's like this big, tall sort of square plastic bottle with a plastic loop at the top, a little hoop for picking it up. Um, anyway, so that's what a lot of the winemaking here is. So it was, it, it took Louis Antoine Luc coming and the rest of the world realizing what these wines were for um, people to start actually making wine for export and, and really bottling it instead of just leaving it in a, in a barrel. Cause that's, so uh, I should just start talking about the wineries. That's probably the best thing to do. I'm gonna get out wine number one here. 
This is Roberto Enriquez, Notro Blanco. So this is actually a Tata. I'll hop back over to the map. So this is, uh, boy, I don't remember on which side of the river it is, but the vineyard is right on this river. It's probably closer to the coast. Oh, yeah, uh, it was somewhere near Coyalimo, Coyalimu and uh, Guaraliwe here, um, looking right, right up above the river, looking down at it. Um, it's a hillside uh, with a lot of <clears throat> sedimentary soil, but then also volcanic uh, stuff <clears throat> mixed in because all of these, you know, the Andes Mountains, all, all of these mountains here were, were volcanoes. It was all volcanic. So there is a lot of volcanic sand, a lot of volcanic matter in the soil around here. Um, this is 2020. This is a blend of Semillon, Moscatel, and Corinto. Corinto is also called Chasselas in, uh, in Europe. Um, the vines were planted in, uh, I should find, I have pictures of the vineyard. The vines were planted like in the first half of the 1900s. When did we go and look at these vineyards? Here. Yeah, uh, the river is just down beyond these trees here, and these are some of the vineyards. I think the vineyard that this, that the Notre Blanco comes from is like just over here to the left off screen, just like beyond these trees over here. Yeah, I think that right there is the vineyard that the Notre Blanco comes from. Um, and this was done in a mix of stainless steel and, uh, and wood barrels, like old, old barrels. And this was 2020, so this actually would have been, when I was there, this would have been made in Roberto's new winery, which is right there. Roberto had just built this new winery when I was there. It was still sort of getting finished up. They were, uh, I don't think it had water yet. That's the inside of a cement tank there. Yeah, that's cool. You can, I can even show, can you see the video? Cool. Neat. Yeah. It smells super aromatic. It smells like Moscatel. The Moscatel here is um, their bush vines. So like super low little bushes just on the ground. They're pretty productive, even though, you know, I don't think any of the vineyards, I don't think any of the vineyards that he works with are irrigated. They're all just totally dry farmed and it's particularly, it is particularly dry here, um, but they're still, you know, they generally don't do any pruning or vineyard management uh, mostly they just let the vines do their thing and grow as much you know leaf canopy as they as they want and produce as many um grape clusters they don't do any green harvesting none of these people do any green harvesting they just literally let the vines like do their thing and then they come back and harvest the grapes Yeah, just it's beautiful aromatics, but it's it's kept from being too much, too aromatic, too unctuous um, by the Semillon and the Corinto. It's a little bit spicy, a little bit aromatic. Um, this is destemmed. I don't think this really has any particular skin contact to it. This this is not really an orange wine. I don't think. I think this is unfined, unfiltered, and zero sulfur. And so that's part of why it has the color and the cloudiness that it has. Um, Roberto here, 
actually worked for Louis Antoine Lut uh, for a bunch of years. And then they had a fall falling out. And that was kind of really great because I think, I think after that was when Roberto went to agronomy st school, got a degree as an agronomist. Um, and part of that, he went and worked in Europe he did an internship with Agnes and Renee Moss. And, you know, so go, the opportunity to go to Europe and live with and work with these legendary natural winemakers in the Loire Valley, you know, bl like blew his mind and uh, completely expanded his idea of the, of the wine world and what's out there for wines and, you know, what, what wine can be and taste like and everything. So uh, that's a big big contributor to his wines and why they are the way they are. Um, uh, geez, what else was I going to say about him? Right. So he went to, a, he's, he's an agronomist. He, they don't have, so he went to a government, uh, like state agronomy program. And as he explained it, they don't really have a, a state winemaking program. Um, you you go to agronomy school, and it's extremely rigorous. It's a four year program. It's considered engineering. Um, so he he said it was it was really hard, really rigorous. Uh, he said that there were only twelve people in his class that actually graduated that made it through the program. Um, so it's so it's a pretty like big deal to do it and get through it and stuff. So it. it um, it was a big deal for him and and it, you know there's not a lot of uh people that make it through the chilean agronomy program so it, it gave him a lot of i don't know a lot of like attention and credibility in, in chile uh, doing that and i want to say uh, i think 2016 was his first vintage that he, for his first like commercial vintage he grew up um around concepcion uh the some of the vineyards that he farms are vineyards that have been in his family for uh, for a while. And I'm looking to see. These are these are actually pictures of me and Matt from Aragosta harvesting Moscatel grapes. So this was a little little tiny hillside vineyard in in Itata, um, and we were picking Moscatel from these little bush vines here early March. It was very hot, very, very hot and sunny. And you can see like you had to really like the, the grapes were right down like on the ground. You had to dig around underneath the plant to find the bunches of grapes. I love the acidity that it's got and the spiciness. It's like a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit of gooseberry, a little bit of like tart fruit, and then a little bit of, a little bit of heat and spice to it. Next up, wine number two. Um, so this is uh, Mauricio Gonzalez Carreño and his Carreño and his wife, Daniela Tapia Ferrard who everybody calls DT, D, D, T, D, T. Uh, let me find some pictures of them. So they're also in BOBO. This is 100% Moscatel though. And this is made in Tenaja, which is super traditional. Let's see if I can get back over here to me. Here we go. There's Mauricio. Uh, so Mauricio grew up in Talca, that city that's uh, that's up a little bit to the to the north, that's more of an industrial city, and then he worked as a winemaker up around Santiago and at some wineries over in Mendoza, Argentina, and I forget if he had worked in Europe too. But he like he was a professional winemaker. He was a serious professional winemaker at at big, famous wineries, um, but he got fed up with it because. Uh, there were a lot of pesticides and just, it wasn't like, it wasn't a good experience. And it also, he, it wasn't, he didn't want to, 
he wanted to start a family uh and it just wasn't a good place to have kids you know he, he explained it like he didn't he didn't feel like he could have his kids around the, the winery or in the vineyard because of the pesticides because of heavy equipment stuff like that so he and uh Dite moved back down here or all the way down here because he was from Talca up a little bit to the north moved down here to Bio Bio uh and Bio Bio so Estacion Yombel here's the town of Yombel right there um so he I think was right down here um just to the north of the Bio Bio River. There we go. So this is 100% Moscatel uh, from super old vines, hand harvested and aged in, there's a picture there, aged in a Tanaha in a big old clay amphora. Uh, so those are those are, were produced natural or produced locally here uh, in Bio Bio, but uh, I don't think anybody is actually making them anymore. Uh, talking to Mauricio about them, he was like, "Yeah, no one no one remembers how to make them anymore exactly. Like I'm sure somebody could figure it out, but there's nobody alive who you know had learned from somebody who had made them traditionally. So as far as he knew." Um, there isn't anybody making Tanahas anymore. So all of them that I think the newest one that he has is like 80 years old. So they're all unsealed clay amphora and they're not any uniform size or shape. They're, they, each, each one is unique and is a slightly different size and shape. Uh, do I still have it? I don't. Oh, well, that's fine. Um, he is, a he makes wine on a tiny, tiny scale. And you saw that winery. He has a new winery now, actually, that he built like last year, which is basically the same, um, except it has a concrete, it's on a concrete slab. So it's not just on dirt anymore. Um, and it's a little bit bigger. So he has more, he has more room. Uh, I forget 2016 might have actually been his first commercial vintage too. Um, when I went and so we went and visited him and then visited um, Cacique Maravilla, which is right nearby. And then we came back here and spent the white, the night with him and Dite. And uh, they were storing wine in their house. So they had like, we went into their living room, dining room, we had dinner and in the center of the room though was just this gigantic pile of cases of wine it was i don't know like seven, 70 cases of wine or something like stacked up in a big mountain in the very center of their of their living room uh, this muscatel i want to say he made something absurd like a uh, hundred cases of or slightly slightly less it doesn't say does not say on here how much, but I want to say he made like less than a hundred cases of this. I feel like it's a little bit less aromatically spicy than the, the Notre Blanco. Maybe a little bit more perfumey. This is, his wines are generally all zero sulfur. He will sometimes add a little tiny bit of sulfur at bottling if uh, it, the wine is not acidic enough, if the pH number is too high, um, which makes the wine a little bit less stable. So he'll sometimes add a little bit of sulfur, but generally the wines are all zero sulfur. And then uh, we're going to do his Pipeno next. So this is uh, this is 100% Pais from Yombel, and I'm 
my pictures here, I think, are maybe out of order. There's extra pictures somewhere. All right, I guess this is the only picture I think I have of, uh, of his vineyard here. So he has vineyards up on a ridge top above his winery. And then the parcel is sort of like contiguous and runs down the hill down to his house. And this, the Pipeno, comes from, uh, geez. The Pipeno comes from uh, volcanic soil down by his house. So it's all this black sand. And then up here on top of the ridge. So it's the same, it's the same vineyard, but up at the top of the ridge, it's more sort of like sandy clay and granitic, granitic soil up here. See if I can find a picture of the uh, soil down by his house. Oh, here we go. Actually, it's, oh, it's a video. There, so it's this like very, very fine black volcanic sand. Uh, so this is 100% Pais from his vineyards there, and where is it? Let's see. This is made in that big upright wooden vat there. That is what's called a pipa. That's where the name Pipeño comes from. Um, Pipeño means like wine from, from a, a pipa. A pipa is a big wooden vat uh very it varies in size but it's always upright staves like that open at the top um and traditionally it would be, be made out of chilean rowley wood which is a super slow growing hardwood from the beach family that used to be really common all over this part of chile anyway and then was all cut down and burned so that they could plant white pine and eucalyptus for the paper industry. So Rowley wood is really rare now um, and it's hard to find. I don't know if there's anybody who's really making like new barrels out of Rowley wood because it's so rare and it's, uh, it's a protected species now. This is relatively light in body, this, this vintage. Uh, this is 11.9% alcohol. Traditionally, of course, like they didn't have bottles here, so they wouldn't bottle wine. They would just make a, a pipa. They'd have a, a big vat like that of wine, and they would just drink from, from the, the barrel, um, you know, throughout the year until it was gone. And that's what pipeño is. Pipeño is like fresh, easy drinking, simple wine is the idea, like made in a pipeño that you just, you know, you sort of, you, you start drinking it when it's young and you just drink it throughout the year. It's not a legally protected term uh, because most people in Chile think Pepeño is really bad wine and look down on it. So, you know, why create governmental rules to protect something that has a negative reputation? Uh, so, so there's actually no rules about what you can or can't put Pepeño on. So there absolutely are Chilean wines that are that say Pipeño on the label that are not actually aged in a pipa like that because you know pipas are hard to come by. Uh, they take a lot of maintenance because most of them are really old wooden barrels now, uh, and you know it's a little bit harder to ferment in them. You have to like maintain the barrel and whatnot. So there there's a fair amount of there are there are wines out there called Pipeños that aren't actually aged in pipa, but um, Mauricio and Roberto are friends. I mean, most of the winemakers around here are all friends because there's not a whole lot of people who are making 
wine like this and trying to export it and stuff. So they all sort of, you know, they support each other. But um, Mauricio and Roberto are good friends. And uh, Roberto, before I went and met Mauricio, Roberto was like, he, he makes the best pipeño there is. Like he makes the best, most honest, traditional, real, authentic pipeño. bright, it's fresh, it's got nice acidity, nice tannin. It, uh, it kind of reminds me of like a Loire, like Grolo, like Gamay, mm -hmm. something like that. It reminds me of like a Loire table red. I absolutely. I mean, I love, he and DT are such sweet people, but I also, I really, like, I really love this wine for the price. Um, I did notice as I was pouring all of these that the, uh, this, the Estacio Yumbel Pipeño, it does have like floaty, little floaty things in it. I've tasted all of them and they all taste delicious. So I kind of chalk it up just to like this, is very, very, very natural wine, <clears throat> you know, made by hand in a very, very small scale. And so like, yeah, it has some sediment to it. It has little, little tiny bits of grape and sediment floating around in it now. It's okay. It's still delicious. It's very real. And then from just across, are these 2020? Okay, that was 2020 now. So this is 2019. This is the Tierra de Pumas here from Roberto Enriquez. Right there. This is 11.5% alcohol. So this is even a tiny bit less alcohol than the Estacio Yumbel Pepeño. Let's see, so then this is from back down here from on the other side of the Biobio River. So this is, uh, I don't see the town here where this is. Hello? Hey, oh, hey, Krista, how are you? Good. Great. I have a couple of wines too that I was picking up, but oh, okay. But um, sorry to bug you. You're probably right off the middle of this. That's okay. Um, I mean, we can do it a different time too. Let me just take a quick look over there to see okay. if the wines are over there. Um, all right. So Tierra de Pumas. I'm gonna hop over to a picture of the vineyard, and then I'm going. I'm gonna go and look for a wine here. So this is Roberto Enriquez, and this comes from land that his grandparents owned. And it's where he first like started making wine. It is... Went there a bunch of times, here we go. Uh, it's this, hill. it's basically like this hill on the backside of this hill, you can see those vineyards over there. Here is, here's Roberto walking around in it. And I think that's actually a bottle of this Tierra de Pumas of the 2019 that he's got in his hand there that we were about to go over.
All right. Back. So Roberto Enriquez. Um, Roberto Enriquez, Roberto is actually really like how I uh, realized that Bio Bio was there um, because uh, he, Edward started bringing his wines in. I think 2017 was the first vintage maybe that they brought in. Um, and he came over to visit in uh, 2018, I think. I think he came to visit in maybe it was 2018. And, uh, you know, like no one knew who he was yet. And uh, so he came to visit and they, I, I, my theory is that T. Edward didn't know what to do completely with him. And, and they were like, oh, what are we gonna do with, with Roberto, with this guy from Chile while he's here? And they were like, uh, hey, Ned, do you wanna meet this guy from Chile? Roberto, do you wanna go to Maine? And Roberto was like, Roberto is all, like extremely, He's a super nice guy. He's very calm, very patient. And he's just also very, I don't know, intense isn't exactly the right word, but he's, he's like up for anything, but very focused, very, very like lucid. And he's a, he's a very sharp person. He's a, uh, but I'm sure that he was just like, yeah, I, I'd love to go to Maine. Sure. I'll, I'll go anywhere. And so he came up here and, uh, and we had an awesome time, you know, like, hanging out for a couple of days and taking him around to meet people and stuff. And, and I was just blown away by these wines, by their, by their balance and the flavors and just how, how lovely and refreshing and pretty they were. Yeah. His wines, ah, oh boy, I, I don't, this might have been sort of a little bit semi kind of carbonic some of some of it like it's not he's he's not doing carbonic maceration anymore um but this is 2019 and he definitely he does a lot of like fermentations in small like plastic like plastic you know tubs and covers some of them sometimes uh well let's see i believe i'll go through a bunch of these so here's roberto in the vineyard and you can see like the vines are just basically overgrown like and they're not the vines aren't in any rows or anything it's just like a field of vines all one on top of the other and you just sort of like slowly have to wade through them and push the branches out of the way and try and figure out where the trunks are so you don't trip over them um the soil there and and in this part of bobo Bio, the soil is a lot of decayed granite so it's, it's a lot of like granitic sand i bet i i bet i actually have that piece of granite over here Okay, I take it back. I don't have that piece of granite, I don't think. But I do have a vine from a piece of vine from that vineyard. So that's a piece of a vine that was pruned or cut off or something there in that in that vineyard. And then actually, this is sort of interesting. I'll stop the screen share for a second so I can do that. So these are rocks from where the Notre Blanco came from. So this is this big piece of volcanic rock of hardened whatever lava pumice that was there in the hillside. But then at the same time, like right in the same holes in the ground, there was, there's this piece of rock, whatever that is, that looks almost like shale. Um, but then these that have been worn smooth by the river there, so the like the soil, uh, where the Notre Blanco came from is a real mix of, of all kinds of stuff together. Anyway, so Tierra de Pumas. Uh, this is where he started making 
wine. And here's a little picture of this, I think was, I don't know, this might've been his grandparents' house at some point or something, or it was like a little, at this point, I think they're, they're using it as like a little camp or like barely kind of using the house. But then, the, so here's the winery. Um, you can see the spigot here in coming out of what looks like a wall. This is actually, I think that is shoring up the ground. So there's earth behind that. But then this up here is a big, like basically old concrete vat. Um, so that's open at the top. And there's, this is in another room. So grapes would come into this other room and get thrown into this big gigantic open vat and crushed. And then the juice can drain out through this little spigot and you can drain that into, you know, whatever the tank or whatever to, to do the fermentation. Um, that a couple of Tinaha. But so it's like that, it's a very, very primitive winemaking operation. And these, vine, these vines in here are like 200 years old. And a bunch of the trees up here are, are old Rowley trees. So it's uh, one of the rare places that still has like a couple acres of like all solid Rowley forest here. You can see more of the soil, this like red. Here, this is almost like red, like clay. Is this Pais too? Mm -hmm. Yep, this is 100% Pais. Mm. More acidity, more minerality, a little bit more like precision. It's a more floral, like pretty, reminds me, reminds me a little bit more of Gamay. Mm. And there's this cool little hill with vines all the way around it. There really, there's nowhere else in Chile, I think where like it's the, the climate is so different here because of that, the open, because there isn't the coastal range. So, like I was here in early March and, you know, for, for like, they were harvesting grapes. It was the beginning of harvest. It was hot during the day, but it got legitimately cold at night still. Um, it was, there's, there's big diurnal swing, temperature swings. And even in the summer, like it does get hot during the day, but it, but it, it cools right down at night. Um, I think partially because of the influence from the ocean. Back to harvesting muscatel there. Um, all right. Last up, the Gonzales Bastias Materal. So also 100% Pais. So all three of the reds here tonight are Pais. Um, down in Bio Bio and Atata, it's pretty rare to find any red wines that are not Pais, it's pretty much all Pais. Um, this is from Itata though, and up in, it uh, not Itata, this is from um, Maule. And up in Maule, there's more, there's other stuff. There's like uh, Carignan and you see, you see other grape varieties up here. But this here is 100% Pais. Come back to the map. So it doesn't look like this is all that far away. Uh, let's see. So Malay, they're right somewhere like right around here, right? I think there's somewhere, Gonzalez Bastias is somewhere like right around here on the Malay, the Malay River. 
uh, outside of the town of Talca, city of Talca. So this doesn't look, you know, like it's that far coming from down here in Bobo Bo and getting up to there. Um, it was a good three hour drive to get up there from where we were down in Bobo Bo to get up here to Talca and then to then getting out to um, Gonzales Bastias took, uh, it was an adventure and I will show you pictures of it now. Um, so Gonzales Bastias, so it's Gonzales Bastias is uh, currently Jose Luis Bastias. Uh, it was, the vineyard has been in his family for five generations. Vines here, 200 years old. Uh, I think I took a picture of this church because it was so, so of the place. So there's this little town, which I think is called Gonzales Bastias. Gonzales Bastias was a famous Chilean poet. And then from that town, it's like an 18 kilometer drive out this little dirt road up over there's a there's a bunch of hills right next to the river and so you have to go up through these hills and then drop down to the winery the winery is right on the river so it's a it's a dead end um and i tried to run there because i had i you know i try to do a lot of running when i go visit wine regions and i had not had an opportunity to do a lot of running here in chile because we've been actually working in vineyards and doing stuff like that so I tried to run here, but we'd just eaten lunch and stuff. And it was like 90 something degrees and there was zero shade. And it's it's just all, it was so incredibly hilly. I only made it like 10 kilometers and then we ran out of time. And so I had to get back in the car so that uh, we could make it there to the winery on time. But it gives you, it was so hot that the dogs didn't even bother to chase me. Like the dogs just didn't get up get up they just they just stayed in the shade it was they'd sort of look at me and be like what are you doing yeah there's a little hand-drawn gonzalez bastia sign and that is what the landscape looks like it's beautiful but it's pretty intense um this so like i was saying uh chile is a huge exporter of paper products um the land down here the whole area is just all controlled by the paper industry um, under the Pinochet uh, dictatorship. The P Pinochet, the Pinochet regime decided to make Chile a paper products, you know, powerhouse. And so they basically gave like free land to a bunch of rich families down here. And then they gave them subsidies to clear cut, burn all of the everything that was there and then fly through with helicopters. And this is still how they do it. They come through with helicopters and they spray white pine or eucalyptus seeds to seed the ground and they grow white pine and eucalyptus. And then they come through and clear cut it when it's mature and repeat over and over and over again. So this had all relatively recently been harvested somewhere. And I think I have other pictures in here of just, it was really surreal to be driving around in rural Chile and have there be white pines everywhere. Anyway, so we got here to Gonzales Bastias. Actually, let me find, <laughs> I've got a, it was as, as we were leaving, I took a bunch of pictures looking back down from the hills because it was, it was all these crazy switchbacks to get down to the vineyard. Um, there, that's it, yeah, so. So there's, so the, you can see the road down here and then I was seeing, so it's a series of switchbacks. Um, but these are the vineyards here, here, and then over there. That's the Malay River right out there. Uh, that's the house and winery. And I don't know. He has, oh, I think that might be a sheep right there. And that was, that's Jose Luis. So we drove out and that was the gate. And then we watched Jose Luis walk out like with a couple of his dogs to go and close the gate. And I think that, I think there's a sheep there. And I think those are a couple more sheep. He grazes sheep in the, in the vineyards. And then 
yeah, there's the river out there. It's an, um, this is just, it's an amazing, beautiful spot. It was really, and just incredible to go through all of this dead, clear cut, like sun roasted, dry hills that had, you know, been devastated by the paper industry and then suddenly drop down into, into this like little tiny garden of Eden here it was crazy. Uh, uh, I'll just take you right on through the whole winery. So open concrete uh, vat. This is how he makes his uh, skin contact, his naranjo. Um, mm. So skin contact, Moscatel, grapes just go in there, ferments, it's there. There's Jose Luis standing in front of a big pipa. Fermenting, that might've been Torrentel. I forget if that's Torrentel or Moscat, but yeah, fermenting on the skins, just sitting out. Pais. And this is all like, this is basically the winery workspace. It's like a pavilion. There's a, there's a roof, but you know, but no walls. It's just totally open to the air. So many yellow jackets. Mm. And then this is the sort of like wine aging, staging area uh his vines are about 200 years old he's the he's the fifth generation of the bastias family to be here and be be farming this they have like five acres of vines and like they don't do they don't prune the vines at all they just let them grow like this all year they go through and they work the soil a little bit, maybe like once or twice a year with hoes, just to keep keep the other plants from growing up through the vines too much. And I don't think they don't let, you know, once once the grapes, once the vines have got grapes on them, they don't let the sheep in the vineyards. No, I don't think sheep really like grapes particularly anyway. But yeah, he was he just kept talking about how how vigorous the vines were and how proud he was of the vines. He was he was an outsized, like very outgoing, garrulous, you know, personality. Super, probably also just super excited to have us to talk to because you know, like where he is, he probably almost never sees new new people. Um, but you know, really happy to walk around and talk to us about the vineyard. Um, at one point he said that, you know, when he dies, he was like, the vineyard's not going to cry for me when I die. And we were like, really? And Matt was kind of, because he'd just been talking about how much he loved these, these vines and how he, he wants to die in this vineyard. And then he was like, but you know, the vines aren't going to cry for me. And Matt was like, maybe a one little tear, maybe a little bit. And uh, Jose Luis was like, no, I've taught my son's how to farm too well they'll take care of the vines the vines won't even know i'm gone they won't even they won't miss me they won't even realize that i'm that i'm not here anymore bunch of the the hose that they use and then we hung out and had dinner outside here and uh and drank all kinds of interesting wines um he oh boy i forget when but he he had an italian wine years ago they like you don't they you know gonzalez bastias had made wine you know for five generations here but i forget when some 10 a decade ago something like that he'd had a bottle of italian wine that that blew them away and there's there's very little foreign wine in chile particularly down here um, so he would have had to, you know, drive up to Santiago or something to, like, to get wine. Um, so he had this bottle of wine from Italy that blew his mind, and he decided to start traveling. And so he started traveling to Italy and France, and he started traveling and visiting different wine regions. Um, he had been to Sicily, he'd been to Marsala, he'd been to the Jura and stuff like that. Um, and really started traveling in order to expand his understanding of the wine world and, and understanding an idea of you know what wine could be and what's out there and that was that was what drove him to start exporting Gonzalez Bastias and you know because it made him it helped him I think understand how special 
these wines are and that they are just as exciting and special as you know the wines of Kos in Sicily and wines from the Jura and stuff like that. Um, so this is uh, this is Maule and Maule, as you can see from that map, uh, I guess I have too many pictures open now. Maybe I don't even have the map to open anymore. Uh, Malay is up to the north, and is uh, behind the coastal range, so it's warmer here. In there, it is in Malay. There we go. Yeah, so down here, it was definitely you know like we could feel it when we were here when I was when I was running down there to the winery. It, it's it was significantly hotter than um, down in Bio Bio and Atata, and it felt it felt like it stayed warmer at night. So the the wines from up here from in Maule are are usually and it's a little bit a little bit further from the ocean too. Um, the wines from here in Maule are usually bigger warmer um a little bit more more fiery i guess sort of kind of this is 13 percent alcohol also 2019. it smells a tiny bit smoky but it also it smells like cherry candies or something like that like the fruit is really pretty Oh, yeah. 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 That was, yeah, so we were, the sun hadn't quite gotten down into the vineyard we were leaving pretty early in the morning to get back down south to visit mauricio i don't think this ever floods we didn't really talk about it but i don't think that this you know like it's definitely this is like river plain right here and so the soil like yes the soil is different this is more like sand and clay and alluvial soils it's not it's not the the decayed granite the granitic soil of um of bio bio boy it smells so pretty it really it reminds me of cherry jolly ranchers <laughs> great structure really well put together. I feel like this might be a little bit of a lighter vintage for, for him to comparatively compared to what he usually does. Um, I believe this, I believe his wines are zero sulfur as well. Um, yeah, a little bit smokier. A little spicier, it's a little bit meaty. Yeah. Um, so Bio, that's they they talk about this whole region, the Bio Bio, Atata, and Maule. They call it the Secano Interior, and I don't really, I don't. It's it's actually it's a Do. It's a Chilean Do. I don't really talk about the Secano Interior because Bio Bio and um, Itata are pretty similar. There's different soils in different places and stuff, but, but Maule is so different climatically and, um, and the soil is really different from the others. So I feel like it's a little weird to lump them together into a single DO. So I, I don't usually talk about Secano Interior, but that's what we just did. We just covered the Secano Interior here of, of Chile. Um, <clears throat> This this sort of stretch of land and the and the winemaking here, um, 
there are other red grapes that are grown more in Maulet. There, like I was saying, there's Carignan. You see Cabernet Sauvignon a little bit more, stuff like that. And there's there's a little bit more. Almost all the winemaking in Biobio and Atata is really small scale local stuff. Um, up in Maulet, uh, it's closer to everything else to the population, and um, there's more infrastructure. So in Maulet, there is more industrial production of wine too um so there's you know like boatloads of inexpensive sauvignon blanc and cabernet and things that are that are produced in in parts of malay and malay is a bigger region there yeah all that anyway uh yeah so that's that's the Sicano. That's my talk on the Sicano interior of Chile. It's a really special place, I think, because of the history and the culture. And these, the vines aren't really quite indigenous, but they like kind of almost might as well be indigenous. Um, Pais did actually emerge in South America. Um, it's a cross between two vinifera, you know, varieties that were brought over, but Pais was, I believe, created, I think, here in, in South America. I think maybe over in Argentina is where it actually emerged. I think maybe it wasn't in Chile, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but they're beautiful wines. They're really cool. Uh, the, I mean, these anyway, there's not, you know, there's a fair amount of winemaking. Most of it's very small scale, local consumption, stuff that's not even bottled, stuff that doesn't come out of the country. Um, the wines that do actually make it out of Biobio and Atata, I think, are generally pretty good. They're pretty, you know, the wines have to be pretty good in order to make it out of this area and make it this far out into the rest of the world. It's it's not easy to get wines out of here. Um, talking to Roberto, uh, he said that he had to have to to ship wines out of the country. Even though you have Concepcion there, which is a pretty big port, uh, the port is just totally set up for exporting paper products. So to export wine, he has to have it trucked up to Santiago and loaded onto a container ship up there. So I forget what he was saying, but it was like maybe eight times. It, it caught, I think it costs him more to get the wine trucked to Santiago than the actual shipping it in a container you know, like two new New Jersey costs. Um, but it's, it is significantly harder and more expensive to get wine out of Biobio and Atata than it is to get wine, you know, from like Touraine or um, Piedmont or somewhere like that, because there just isn't the infrastructure here, uh, because so little wine is, is actually exported. Um, so it really, it's a, it's an uphill battle for anybody making wine here. So anybody making wine and exporting it has to be pretty, pretty passionate, really care about what they're doing. And for the wines to really actually get out and get here, they have to be, they have to be pretty good. Um, I'm excited about them. I love the place and I'm, I'm really, I'm excited. There are more and more people who are making wines and exporting them from here. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see more. And I think it's, one of the most exciting wine regions in the world right now. So I think we'll keep on hearing more and more about it. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for watching. I will, uh, I'll talk to you all later.